and um, take some time to still our bodies and still our minds, open our hearts, be more aware. So let's begin now establishing our postures. Seeing if we can be comfortable in the body and yet maintain that moment to moment alertness in the mind. It's helpful to connect awareness with the body by noticing first any places of tension or holding, unpleasant or even pleasant sensations that are connected to the body. It's a very rare thing that we do in our lives or in our day. I always feel like it's very respectful to the body to acknowledge it in this way. This simple purity of intention and attention. This body that carries us through our lives. And then opening the awareness to receive whatever is happening in our particular environments. Hearing the bird songs from Maui mm -hmm. or from your place, wherever you are in the world. Opening to whatever the sense of the um, atmosphere, environment feels like, coolness or heat, softness, however you sense what's going on around you, smelling, seeing with the eyes closed, even hearing. Now, checking the mind. What is the attitude of the mind right now? And of course, it's always changing. How can we soften and relax around the mind in a similar way that we have with the body? We can check if we have any agenda for the sitting. Mm. Or even bigger than that for our lives. And just letting go of any attachment to result. We might be noticing what there is in the mind. However it is, letting it be, letting it go. Relaxing the mind. And then tuning into whatever supports you to be with your practice moment to moment. Sometimes some of us or many like to begin with connecting with the body bringing mindfulness, awareness to bodily experience, or perhaps more precisely with the breath, how that is experienced empirically in the body. Close attention to in and out breath at the belly or the nostrils. Some of you find it more supportive to begin with the more open attention. Let's begin to noticing immediately with choiceless awareness, whatever presents itself naturally. Those of us who begin with body breath, gradually it's opened up to more 
perhaps immediately, sooner than later, whenever it is, know what you need to do. See if we can notice any of the five sense doors that are presenting moment to moment, seeing, smelling, tasting, hearing sensations in the body. Or it might be that the mental realm is more accessible to us right now, thinking, worrying, appreciating, goodwill, aversion, whatever it is. See if we can maintain the neutrality of simple awareness to whatever's going on moment to moment. In the next 20 something minutes, refreshing your attention, your intention to be mindful whenever you need to.
refreshing your intention to be mindful. If your mind gets caught up in thinking or lost in it, notice the attitude of the mind in relationship to that thinking. Notice a mental state that might be accessible to know. What's fueling those thoughts? Is it sadness or anger, joy or appreciation no blame just knowing what's going on
So before I, I hand it over to Steve, who's going to give a little, what we call a dharmet, <laughs> uh, I just want to say how happy I am to be here with all of you. As many of you are familiar, most of you very familiar to us, and um, it's just wonderful to have this connection for me. As Steve will speak also for himself. Um, we were we would be there around this time period and and so that's why we didn't want to miss the chance to connect so when we were invited to offer something we quickly said yes so here we are the today steve's going to talk a little bit um about um, conditions <laughs> and and then i i'll do some speaking and then we'll have um a time for some q a uh, hopefully there will be, so we can continue a little um, mm -hmm. dharmatizing with you. So I'll hand it over to Steve now, and um, yeah, see you in a bit. I'll sit by the side. Okay. First, I want to uh, thank you for inviting us to uh, share the Dharma with you as we have over the past 24 years. 24 years, I've been told. And just because we ha ha don't happen to be there in person, uh, we can say that we're there in our heart. So the connection is sustained and augmented by our gathering together during this time of extraordinary conditions in our life. So we want to, or I want to acknowledge that we are living in a very tumultuous time. And it is the imposition of the changing social, political, economic, mental health conditions are both overwhelming, ominous, and extraordinarily impactful on all of us. Not to minimize for anyone what the conditions are that we all are living with and dealing with. So just to acknowledge that all that we feel, the disbelief, the judgment, the fear, the anxiety, the terror, and more. This is natural. To not, to not feel these things would be uh, sticking your head in the sand. And so if you are connected with each other and the larger community that we all live in and with, then you can't help but be impacted and to have a deeply conditioned reactivity to what's going on. And that reactivity, while it's painful and uh, unwelcome, I would say, uh, still it is, it is natural. It is a natural response or reaction to what we are experiencing. And we don't have to be any closer than here we are right here and to have our hearts connected and acknowledging how it is for us. The events of our collective life are abhorrent. They're brutal. They're not what we expect of ourself or others. And we know that we can do better. It'll take courage as we are cultivating here to not turn away from anything that strikes our heart uh, painfully. It's just being human. 
living with the conditions that arise. Not always of our choice, not always pleasant, but nevertheless, this is the hand of cards that we've been dealt with during this time. And it's our Dharma practice to play the hand as skillfully and as compassionately as it's possible. I noticed that when the abhorrent continuing instances of brutality play through my mind or through the news, I have a deeply conditioned social, political, physical, mental, family, educational reaction to it. This is normal. There's nothing wrong with that. What makes it so wishing we could avoid it is because it's so outside of our immediate experience, but it is really close. So we're not avoiding, we're not minimizing or dismissing all that we feel. In fact, this is the first step in cultivating an understanding that will uh, loosen the grip of suffering in your heart and mind. So this is, this is nothing more than the, the, the Buddha's first noble truth is there is suffering in our life. And to not turn away from it takes courage. It takes awareness. It takes a strong intention to be present for all of your life. As painful as it is. To avoid it is worse. To deny it, to minimize it, to explain it away, to blame others is not taking personal responsibility. To respond in a more skillful and maybe a less reactive way. Because we all have a deeply conditioned uh, understanding of what is, what is skillful, unskillful, what is uh, beneficial for yourself and others, how to be compassionate in situations like this. We know this is the track that we're headed to. And it's not immediate, it's not always available, but this is our practice. Not to deny anything that we're experiencing or feeling, but to open to it, acknowledge it, See if we can accept what this feeling is within ourselves, and act on that from a place of awareness, compassion, wisdom. That's our work. And sometimes we do it individually. Sometimes we do it collectively. Sometimes it's very hot. Sometimes it's really chilled out. Nevertheless, we have to deal with it. And we deal with it in a whole variety of ways. But awareness is primary to it. Without uh, abiding and interest in being aware of what's going on, we'll avoid it. We'll miss the opportunity to really develop our own heart mind. And there'll be times when it's just, it's overwhelming and we can't open to it. And we just get caught in blame and shame and judgment. This is, this is natural. This is our cultural, family, social, economic conditioning. We can't avoid it. It is, con it is conditioning how we respond, how we react to the situation. But we have additional allies in 
the Dharma. The Dharma says, it's okay. Things happen. They're mostly out of your control. How you respond to them is your practice. And we don't always get what we want. Things are changing. You're not in control. This is familiar Dharma teaching. And this is the place for really not just laying on a Dharma understanding on our experience, but let our Dharma understanding inform our experience and how to work with it. This is a, uh, the acid test of our Dharma practice. Can we stay present? Can we be compassionate? Can we be wise? Uh, not shrinking away from anything. Because our conditioning, our family-oriented conditioning and social economic conditioning is deeply, deeply, deeply rooted. And so to minimize it or deny it or avoid it uh, is not going to work. So we have to confront it. And this is what we do with practice. But along with practice, practice of awareness is we have the ally of the Dharma, the teachings of, oh, how to deal with suffering, how to acknowledge suffering, and how to deal with suffering. And this is encoded, of course, in, in the Buddha's teaching of the Four Noble Truths, and particularly for our practice in dealing with this situation is taking a look at the three trainings of the Noble Eightfold Path. How can we use the Buddha's teachings to inform how we understand what is going on within ourselves, within our society, within our culture, within our relationships? Because the Dharma is everywhere. We're not doing social, political, economic work here and Dharma over there. Dharma is right in the middle of all that you're doing in your life. And so to bring the, the understanding of the Dharma into all your activities is a skillful way of approaching all of this work, all that we're living with. I don't need to give you a whole discussion or Dhamma talk on the Noble Eightfold Path, but the Noble Eightfold Path basically is three trainings. And they're graduated trainings to guide us in responding to suffering. Our own, others, individual, collective, societal, and there's plenty to deal with. So the challenge for us is to hear the Dharma, stay connected to our direct and immediate experience, and let the Dharma inform how to understand, how to practice with, how to uh, appreciate the work that you've done over, from, from some of you, I can see decades, <laughs> decades of practice. You know, it doesn't stop anywhere. Here we are. So learning how to, you know, uh, undertake the three trainings to, you know, to monitor your speak, speech and actions. There's a lot of push, there's a lot of shove of what's going on, acting and speaking, and sometimes it can be pretty hot, very hot. But that's not unskillful. If it's infused with compassion and understanding, we do what we have to do, as long as we're not harming others, or trying not to harm others. And this is... Sometimes the best we can do is not harm others. So being careful with our speech, 
being careful with our actions, very important. And yet, there's a lot of activity going on in our hearts and minds that is just not calm. It's not, it's not anything we want to share with anybody because there's rampant judgments and fear and a blame and self-judgment and feeling overwhelmed and disempowered. And these are normal feelings. They're normal. Doesn't, you're not unnormal for feeling any of that. But being careful about how to recognize not just acting them out. Being able to recognize, oh, this is what's going on within me in relationship to the conditions outside, let's say. And when we do pay that kind of attention, then we're taking not just ourselves into account, we're taking everyone that we come in contact with. And we're in contact with everyone, whether you see, hear, know, or not. We're all impacting each other. Collectively, we either support unskillful conditioning or we support skillful Dharma understanding. And when we meet like this with each other, we have an opportunity to reaffirm our interest in ending suffering, ourselves individually, society. Uh, and there's a lot, lot of opportunities. So learning how to monitor and carefully uh, act on our impulse and intentions to speak and act in a way that might feel unskillful. Sometimes it's really hot and really generates a lot of energy and intention and we don't, we don't have to be afraid of that. We do have to be careful not to harm others by how we speak, how we act, and let that be. This is nothing more than what we've been practicing, just being kind, compassionate, uh, careful. But more than that, or in addition to that, the Dharma offers us an ally in how to understand events inside ourselves and outside of ourselves and our family and social and educational conditioning is not always the best guide for how to respond to the situation we've had generations of politicians and uh, educators of one sort or another that have tried and we still end up here we are really caught in this quicksand of suffering. So it's not easy, but it's our Dharma commitment that makes it possible to take an interest in unraveling our conditioning that judges and blames and, you know, making a mess of personal relationships and how to acknowledge that and say that there's, there's gotta be another way. And we know that other way, we've been practicing that way. As long as you've been hearing the Dharma and practicing the Dharma, you know that without awareness of your own inner process, not just awareness of the outside conditions, yes, that's urgent and necessary, but being equally aware of the inner terrain of the heart-mind is also necessary. And so having that uh, understanding is the key to at least addressing your own and social conditions that leads to suffering. Sometimes we'd like, and I, I, I also would like to just make it happen, you know, get exercise about it and make what I want to happen, happen. There's a teaching on that. <laughs> Mostly we, we cannot. 
control everything that happens to us and we can't affect changes outside ourselves just because it's what we understand to be the right thing to do, the skillful thing to do. So we don't want to deny that, but we also don't want to be overwhelmed by that. Just can't do it. But in our hearts, we can be headed in the right direction, wanting to understand how this is all happening, how this is happening within me, within our uh, relationships, in our culture, in our society, our political system, economic system, without understanding, can, things will continue as they have been. With, that, with growing understanding, gradually we can shift, or we'll see a shift in how we deal with these kinds of situations. Patience is a, patience and perseverance, both uh, sorely needed during this time. So I've spoken longer than I had thought just to introduce the collective space we're all living in and with, uh, and have been for, well, let's just say decades, but it's becoming more apparent uh, to some of us, and it's painfully apparent to many. So thank you for checking in. I hope that we have something to say and share some time with you all that is beneficial for you. Thank you very much. Carol's going to <laughs> have a... Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Oh, now I can see you. Oh, okay. <laughs> So it's um, just want to echo some of Steve's words and acknowledge that it is really a seismic changing time. Um, I think th I've heard from many others and uh, Steve and I are in our 70s and we've never experienced this much upheaval um, at many levels. So uh, just to acknowledge that it's it's heart-wrenching, and yet it's a time of great breakthrough. There's a lot of realizations and um, more receptivity to the education of what all of us need to open to that has gone on for 400 years and more. So we really want to um, do the best we can to open our own hearts and uh, to our own practice to what's going on within us, as well as what's around us. So I was pondering on what uh, the best qualities of mind are, what the most useful qualities of mind might be that could help us during this time. And um, just looking into my own heart, realizing how painful it is to face what's going on outside of us, of course, this understanding of compassion and the usefulness of it during this time is um, so obvious for us. It said that, and we know that compassion opens to pain. It opens to suffering. And uh, sometimes we wonder why is it not uh, part of the paramis actually, <laughs> The parmis are those very noble experiences and the beautiful emotions that we can have in order to help us through life. And um, it said that it's because of compassion that we come to understand those parmis. Because all of those parmis help us in places where we need more understanding, where we need to know how to face painful events, and without getting identified, without wrenching our hearts so much that we can't do anything about ourselves or others. 
and also how to face the joys of life without hanging on. So I wanted to remind ourselves today about the beauty and the benefit of compassion. And then another quality is equanimity. So these are two qualities already um, that are within us. We all know these qualities. Um, they might be, it might be challenging sometimes to bring them up, but we all know that we have the potential to realize them more and more strongly. Well, what we need to do is actually call them forth. Um, sometimes we forget about this very um, important quality of mind, which is called intention, which is called, you know, just that mind that knows what's beneficial and that can lean in that direction. So using our intention to bring forth uh, compassion when we're facing any kind of pain and we notice that it's hard to open to the pain outside of ourselves, what we can do in that moment is call forth that quality. So you all have done the practices before of metta, compassion, um, most of you, if not all of you. So what is your phrase? What is your intention that helps you open your heart? So for me, it's very simple, in very simple words. It's when I see what's going on in the news or just hear voices that are very difficult for me to open to, I give myself the um, encouragement and remember to bring up the intention, may I open my heart to this. More than ever, I see my heart closing down to um, uh, conditions outside of myself in all levels of, of politics, of um, the injustices that go on in the world, close family members, hard to open to. So what is it that we can say to ourselves to bring up that intention? Some of us may use the a compassion phrase. So find your go-to phrase, and I, I want to be very practical in offering you some help. Find your go-to phrase and use that phrase, you know, in relationship to when you're watching the news or when you're hearing somebody going through like a, a terrible inner storm because of what's going on in the world or their family or their um, situation in life, whether it be a person of color, or a person of culture, or um, a person of the various genders that are not being uh, accepted and uh, open to in this world, or maybe there's places of um, seeing people with different uh, abilities that we close down to or we uh, shun. Just finding out where it is where our heart closes down and making it a um, intentional thing that we do every day. May I open my heart to this pain that we see around us. Because it's said that uh, compassion is a precursor for beneficial action. So we need to make the, to remember first, to be aware that we're opening to suffering to call forth that compassion that can connect with that suffering. And then after that, to take action or use words that would be beneficial for that, to really not just stop at compassion, but actually open to what needs to be done about it. And if we're coming from a place of one of the uh, near or far enemies of compassion, and I'll mention that in a minute, then we refrain. We just wait. We pause. And then maybe it's a minute. Maybe it's an hour. Maybe it's a day that we pause to reflect upon what can we do here? What can we say that will help? And do that. Maybe it's only to one person. Or maybe we have to write that letter or make that phone call to um, someone in our legislature, in our community. So um, compassion opening to what's going on outside of ourselves. 
but especially compassion for ourselves. When we feel that pain, we don't know what to do about it outside of ourselves. How can we turn towards what's going on inside? So normally we're not always gonna find compassion as she was talking about. We may find what is called uh, the near enemy or um, the near relative of compassion, which seems like that, but it isn't that. It's when we're drowning in sorrow, when we feel so much grief inside that we feel paralyzed, we can't do anything at all. So we need to know that part of the terrain of our hearts and minds. Can we come there and be with that place, know that we're drowning or we're so um, obsessed with what we really want to do or have or have it be in the world and it's uh, helplessness. So know, know those areas of our own heart and mind and see if we can bring an awareness there that allows us to kind of rise up um, and not get so lost there. That's a near enemy of compassion, is um, that feeling hopelessly in grief. There is a, a beneficial grief that can allow it to come and go and to be strong with it. But sometimes mixed within there before then, we feel that hopelessness or that helplessness. So know that place, bring awareness there, bring some kind of um, energy to the mind, bring forth some support that you need for yourself, and then maybe um, investigate what else is here in the mind. It might be what is called the far enemy, far enemy of compassion is cruelty, some kind of aggression with our thoughts, with our words, with our deeds. So see whether that's present. It's uh, any kind of aversion or cruelty. It's not just aversion per se, but it's stronger than that. It's like when we want to strike out or when we feel that urgency to hurt through our words or actions. So what we can do right there is to bring compassion to ourselves, see how we can um, bring some kind of assuaging of the own heart, our own hearts there and pause, give ourselves some time. Sometimes we're acting out so much in the world because we haven't brought enough compassion to ourselves. So see what we can do in that time period. And then when we feel the courage that can come from a balanced heart, take action. It said that the action or the words that have really strong impact in the world are, is the action that comes from not just compassion, but strong equanimity. Equanimity is assisted by wisdom. So it has the wisdom to know that this is beneficial or it's not beneficial. If it's not beneficial, we refrain when we see when we see what's going on in our own hearts with equanimity. When it is beneficial, we take action, we take the step. So compassionate action is empowered by equanimity. So know when that's happening, when you can come to the middle path and say, I can take action without aversion or without drowning in grief. That's the middle path there, that middle path of compassion. And then how is that empowered? By equanimity. Equanimity is not apathy. It's not like not caring at all. Neither is it, is, is it reactivity, as Steve was talking about. But it's a strong sense of responsivity, um, taking responsibility taking a, an action or saying something to respond. And we know we're not in reactivity of attachment to how we think it should be or aversion to how it is. This is the far enemy, aversion or attachment, which is reactivity. And the near enemy is apathy, just not caring at all. So that's the terrain around equanimity. Awareness helps us to know our terrain, to be responsible for how we feel. And carrying that responsibility out, 
we we pause if we're feeling that what we're going to do or say is going to cause harm we pause we refrain we wait we contemplate what can we do now and then when we feel there's time to take action we do that take action so there have been many there are many ex examples and um, possibilities um, to do that in this world now more than ever luckily we're all in a mostly in a safe place um, so i i feel for my brothers and sisters of color and of different genders that are being um, brought some injustices and threatened and um, we have to speak up for one another we have to take a stand we have to compassion brings courage so not to sit around with apathy and say you know that's the kind of dumb equanimity when you say this is how it is but you know you don't do anything about it so let's take a stand for places where there have been injustice today and in the world for the past many hundreds of years um, do what we can know our hearts connect to the hearts of others it's so simple sometimes so thank you for your kind attention and all of that and i know you're all doing the best you can and um we're really happy to be of benefit be here for you we need help too mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have each other and our own colleagues um, that remind us all the time and many of you too are students loved ones question so are there yeah I'm wanting to open to questions i see okay um oh so i see freda yeah that oh i see a little hand <laughs> first time I'm gonna bring this. okay <laughs> um so freda do you want to ask your question you can uh you're unmuted now right i'm on a, a board of directors of a food co-op and there is this place that wants us to have a second location there and they are i i don't like them they're they're gentrifying the downtown and they want us to be in their food court and we're having a study session about this on wednesday i think and today I shared something that a, a black friend of mine wrote about how awful she thinks this group is. But I am very, very concerned about how I'm going to handle myself in this meeting and how mm -hmm. I'm going to handle myself around the other members of the board if they somehow decide they want to be a part of this thing that I think is really abhorrent. Um, so I'm very, I'm very apprehensive how I'm going to handle myself. Right. I can say something first. Thank you, Freda. Yeah. Um, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> when I'm in a situation like this and I have some uh, worries about oh you know i i feel kind of oh, reactive inside and i might speak or act out of that or um say something where i'm not thinking straight even beforehand even before i go i'm i start making the intention may i act and speak with wisdom and compassion so you I mean, even even days before, you know, I might start saying, inclining the mind towards uh, wisdom and compassion, towards may I say something beneficial, may I may I speak without blame, but only speaking of my own heart and how it feels. You know, maybe you need specific instructions for yourself. Know the places where you need help and make those intentions beforehand uh, of um, 
because the more you make the intention and remember it, the, the easier it will come up when you're in that place of facing, uh, facing your, your community there. Yeah. So during that time um, beforehand is helpful. And, and especially during the time at the time, if you, if you sense being aware of what's going on in your heart and you sense that this is aggression, this is, this will be aggressive, um, you know, then, then pause. And you might even say, let me take a moment to pause before I say something. Things like that, yeah, can help. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. If, if you think you made a mistake and said something inappropriate, take that as a lesson to learn from, not to judge yourself uh, uh, as being inadequate or unskillful, but to recognize, oh, yeah, that was, that's, that's not so skillful. Let me, let me try again or let me yeah. remember that so that we can learn. We can't do everything perfectly uh, mm -hmm. all the time, but we can learn. Yeah. Good. It's good to point that out also, because sometimes we can be so surrounded by the suffering and what's difficult that we don't see that. But, so thank you so much. And um, it is, it's a big time of, it's a big, big breakthrough. The biggest silver lining of this all is that we are um, opening our hearts to the suffering that's gone on for a long time. And that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. And seeing, you know, there's such um, beauty in uh, opening to suffering. We can see that. You know, you taught, you said a few times, seeing the goodness, seeing the goodness. And it said that the proximate cause for metta or goodwill to arise is seeing the good. So the more we can see that, yeah, it's, it's a good mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. I'm, uh, quite some time ago, I guess it was in March, somebody had attended a talk by Robert Thurman, and he, he, I think he was quoting somebody else, but the, I wish I knew the person quoting this, but I don't. This, uh, Robert Thurman said, Mother Earth has sent us all to our rooms to contemplate what we've done and how we can make life better, something like that. So in a way, you know, we can see the blessing of this pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yes. Thank you. It looks like there's a comment in the chat, Stephen Kamala from Roseanne. I don't know if you can see that or if you'd like me to read it. Open it up, yeah. The three trainings. Can you speak more about them? What they are? Thank you. Oh, yes. I mentioned the three trainings of the, the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, the trainings are forces of purification. So when we carefully monitor and are mindful of our speaking and intention to speak and to act, then we are purifying our heart mind of the most aggressive a type of kalesas that causes suffering, suffering for others. Of course, we're suffering when we act out in that way too. But by practicing and being aware of how we speak, how we act, the, the intention behind it, and the skill with which we do that, that is really important because it, it, it purifies our intention and we're less likely to s stick our foot in our mouth, so to speak. And we can actually monitor before we speak. So that's, so that's the first kind of training to purify our heart mind. 
And the second is, even if we are careful in speaking and acting and not harming anyone overtly, our minds can be rampantly uh, judging and fearing and thinking what we don't dare say. Okay, so if we just let our minds roll around in all of our judgments and fear and blame, we suffer. And it'll come out in other ways. So training the mind to be aware, this is mindfulness, this is basic mindfulness, is be aware of what is going on. As painful as it is, you know, without that awareness, we're, we're being jerked around by deep, unskillful conditioning. By being aware, then we can exercise some restraint, some uh, learning, uh, learning how and when to let go of our views and opinions and voicing them, and training our mind to just be present with what's going on, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. That's the second training, watching our mind. So we purify our speech and behavior initially by restraint and practicing the, the five precepts. And the second training is watching your mind because in the mind, all, all the activity of the mind comes out eventually, either through thoughts, uh, words, actions. And so we want to be train ourselves in watching the mind. And this is where we have to deal with all of our um, preferences, our deep conditioning of what we think it should be. And then our Dharma, our Dharma understanding confronts our deep family social conditioning. And that's going to be necessary for all of us is to unwind our family, social, political, economic conditioning by paying attention to minute movements in the mind toward or away from skillfulness. And even with that, we still have these beliefs and assumptions about life that how it should be, what we learned as your children and have been, that has been reaffirmed for, for decades, that is not skillful. You know, some of, the, some of the conditioning that we receive from our parents and social and political and economic and educational trainings is not leading to peacefulness, understanding, compassion, and we have to recognize that. And as we do, we can begin to really change our understanding, the deep conditioning of assumptions, beliefs um, that are motivating unconsciously much of what we, what we do, how we think, how we understand. And as we practice more awareness and we, we pay careful attention to what's, what we do and what the response is, then we begin to um, adjust our misunderstandings to come more into line with, oh, this is a skillful thing to do. My old conditioning, family conditioning, social conditioning, whatever, is not particularly useful in this situation. Okay. You can't just change your deep conditioning, but you can recognize that it's unskillful and work to grow in understanding otherwise. So this, these, are, these are the train trainings, purifying the speech and behavior, purifying your mind and then purifying your understanding. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Thanks, thank you for the question. It's a whole, it's a, a lifetime of trying to answer that question. <laughs> That's what Dharma practice is. Is there more? Um, uh, 
Um, well, many of you know this, but I, I say it as an example of, um, I'm saying it from experience that when I first started practicing, I could only practice mostly in daily life. And I took it very seriously, you know, and I couldn't sit every day, but I could, when walking, I could know that walking was happening. When seeing, there was awareness that seeing is happening. Hearing is present. You know, just the basic things that we practice every single day, uh, we have opportunities to develop awareness with. I practiced that. I practiced that way for many years before I could go on to retreat. Just the simplicity of being with the five sense doors, um, sometimes but not every day even, being able to sit. And then when I went to a retreat where there was an ability to quiet the, the body and the mind more, the practice was able to go... Um, quite to subtle places almost you know more more quickly than if i had not been practicing i was told so uh being able to be with everyday experiences is very powerful just knowing when you're when you're sitting knowing when you're walking the four postures in practice are very important to bring your attention to every day even if you don't do it, it very um, in a precise way, like reaching or turning, but you just know when the body's sitting, when standing is happening, laying down, uh, walking, so all of those four. So not to take those as kind of um, nursery school. <laughs> They're really, they go a long way. Um, and from there, the deepest understandings can come. So just wanted to put a word in for the simplicity of, you know, home practice like that. Thank you. Let's see what else we have here. Um, give an example from your lives. What, what's a form of conditioning that you're working on transforming? Whoa, whoa, I grew up in... Uh central Maine, which is not the hotbed of progressive thinking, I should say. And just having to confront my own family conditioning of, uh, let me just say, denial of suffering was paramount in my conditioning. Suffering never happened. And having to open, to, of course, practicing for 40 years, of course, I've got some understanding. But still, there are times when, even now, I recognize, oh, boy, I am reacting from, you know, my old, my old family conditioning. But luckily, I have been informed by the Dharma that, you know, there's other ways of understanding what's going on. And to make space for that, to be willing to put aside my um, unskillful beliefs, assumptions, uh, judgments that, you know, I inherited from my parents. And, you know, I'm 70 years old, uh, so more than 70 years old, and, and the family conditioning is still really strong. I'm not acting it out so much, and I don't really believe it, but it's readily available if I'm not being careful. Mm. So you just have to be really uh, almost, just have to be relentless in being aware of what's going on in your mind or you'll be taken over by deeply unconscious conditioning. That's, And where, where I grew up in central Maine, uh, let me just say there were no people of color. Uh, in fact, there was nobody of, that wasn't of the same religious domination, denomination. You know, all of the 
white Anglos lived in the town I was in, but 12 miles down the river where all the French Canadians lived. And the two didn't mix, but that was the, mm. that was the division. And I'm not proud of this, but there's a famous uh, postcard from my hometown that shows a Ku Klux Klan march down Main Street in the town I grew up in. And it was led by the chief of police. And I, come, I have come to find out that there were a greater percentage of people in the Ku Klux Klan in New England than there was anywhere in the South. Wow. Mm. That's a conditioning that I just didn't, I just didn't, I didn't know that that was my inheritance, so to speak. But, and it's been a process of recognizing that as, I don't want to say subtle, it was subtle to me, but it wasn't subtle to those who were at the front line of that. So that's, it's not an ongoing thing. It's not an active ongoing thing for me now, but it's a deeply uh, instructive experience I have had around how blind we are to our conditioning. Yeah. It causes ourselves another suffering, perpetuating this kind of divisions. Is that, is that mm. the answer to the right question? Yeah. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> lost track. <laughs> <laughs> I love you both so much and I hope this feels like home away from home for you always do um, yeah great oh, you're, our, you're, our, you're our cousin Sangha yes <laughs> <laughs> yes yes may it, may that, it be so yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> yeah thank you just... uh, for the invitation uh, I was uh happy to get the invitation and to be able to share, to connect with you all and to have a share a little bit of our thoughts and processes and uh, understanding. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Take care, everyone. And maybe if I can mention one more thing before everybody departs, just that um, the way things work at Common Ground is we operate on Donna, which means that all the teachings are offered freely and it's up to us to um, participate in the cycle of giving and receiving. And if you'd like to participate in giving tonight, uh, you can do that online. Gail Iverson, our bookkeeper, is here tonight and she'll receive the donations even from home. And she'll be able to offer two thirds of the Donna received directly to Steve and Kamala to support their livelihood and continue teaching in this way. It's really a beautiful gift that they and others offer the Dharma wholeheartedly free of charge. So please feel welcome to participate if it feels right to you and we'll make sure they get it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. everyone.